Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Sarah, and thank you all of you from the Narrative Center who organized this. Um, I'm very honored to be here, and I'm so excited. I, I think I know most of you, and I'm very flattered that you would choose to spend a Thursday, Tuesday, Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> I've obviously not accelerated at the moment. I, I, I really <laughs> wish I was accelerating. Um, at the very last week of classes, listening to me talk a little bit about my work. So I was asked to talk about silence, which is a theme that's run through my work, um, which I haven't really written about per se, um, but, but, but it's a theme. And so I was thinking about how I wanted to present this. So what I'm going to do is I want to start with a couple of what I'm calling contentions. Um, and that's sort of an honor if I can give a plug to our event tomorrow, our contentious <laughs> conversations here at SCAR. Um, I want to offer two contentions, which basically um, I want to argue that CAR as a field has really under-theorized silence and in fact is really quite deeply and actively ambivalent about what it might mean for us. Um, so I want to start with those contentions. And then my training is as an anthropologist, and so I do a lot of field-based research, ethnographic research, and a lot of my theory comes from a, trying to listen to other people and how they frame their worlds and their concerns. So I want to then turn to some ethnographic examples, the first one from post-genocidal Bali, Indonesia, and I want to talk about how people have been living and speaking and not speaking um, and speaking in, in sort of counter um, hegemonic ways in the aftermath of mass violence. And then I want to talk about post-conflict Aceh or post-peace actually Aceh. And I want to show you, this is why I'm so excited to be here today, um, as this is my world premiere of the seven minute excerpt from an upcoming documentary film about post-peace Aceh that I'm going to share with you that I want to talk about how people are speaking in that context as well. So that's that's my plan. Um, I'm not going to be lecturing for, for two hours. I saw that we were, we were scheduled for two hours, which is wonderful. So I'm hoping we can use some of that time for conversation because I think that this is an issue that we can all, um, I'm, I'm feeling sort of very punished and ironic, that we can all speak to, um, <laughs> or that we, can all, that we all, all can can weigh in on how we think about speech which doesn't present necessarily in the genre and format in which we're expecting it to. So um, I gave the title of my talk, Beyond Speaking as Healing, and that will become clear in a moment, um, Silence, Voice, and the Politics of Repair. Ah, beautiful. Um, and I had a lovely keynote, which won't show here, so my, my formatting got messed up. So it's not as aesthetically pleasing as it was five minutes ago. So anyway, so this is my first contention. Um, the car has traditionally operated with a narrow frame of speech and voice. Um, and theoretically, I want to say, first of all, that we've tended to rely on models of subjectivity or models of personhood, how the self comes to be, um, that frame selfhood in terms of the ability to speak the ability to speak oneself into being as a foundational framework for how we see the self. Um, and this, I think, is problematic in the sense that we fail to recognize just how historically and culturally located this kind of framework is. And here I'm offering a few examples. Um, Christian confessional practices, the idea that one must speak one's sins in order to be cleansed, in order to find salvation and, 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 and uh, a true self. Um, psychoanalytic models of repression and then its release, the idea that if you're silent, if you're not speaking, that this is a form of either oppression or repression, right? And that kind of steam theory of being that it's naturally going to come out, that the natural tendency is to voice um, one's, one's innermost self. And then this modern era of the witness. Think about the aftermath of the Holocaust that Sarah Fetterman works on. And people have talked about this as the era of testimony, the era of witness, the idea of political agency, a central model for political agency being speaking to suffering, speaking to wrong, speaking to um, violations of justice, speaking to um, horrific events, conflicts, and so on and so forth. Um, and then also the, the modern era of, of status updates. And you see a real generational difference. So I can really even see it sort of as a middle-aged person, right, that my parents' generation wasn't necessarily one in which to speak of experience was seen as crucial to the self, um, but my children's generation absolutely is, where everything is Twitter, you're, you're tweeting me now, right? And that seems to be important, um, right? That, that one must constantly be speaking the self and sharing the self in oftentimes very intimate ways. And in a moment when I turn to my ethnographic research, I want to contrast that with the way in which the self is 
formed in a place like Indonesia, which has a very, very different kind of sort of ontology of being. Um, I often give the example of here, if you're going to fall in love with somebody, right? So if you're going to fall in love with somebody, you're going to decide to commit to something like marriage or long-term partnership. You're going to do it after a lot of talking, right? A lot of talking, a lot of talking, a lot of talking over months and months, maybe even years. And once you've sort of shared everything, you kind of dragged it all up from the bottom, everything there is to share about self, then you can see yourself as having an authentic relationship. And that would be contrasted with something like the folks I know in Bali, who it's usually kind of mystical glances across a crowded, not even room actually, sort of an open temple space, but or just faith. Right? So the sense of self as really being grounded in language and speaking the self as being something that's relatively particular culturally and that's also relatively recent at a particular historical moment that's inflected by um, these historical influences like the confessional, like psychoanalytic models of being. Um, so why is this important? So what I'm saying here is that models of post-conflict psychosocial repair or reconciliation or transitional justice pick up this sense that speaking the self is crucial to subjecthood um, and turns this into programming that oftentimes assumes, I would argue, in a problematic or oversimplifying way, that speaking leads to healing in some kind of linear, straightforward way, right? That if we want to reconcile in the aftermath of conflict, that what we need to do is we need to sit down and we need to talk, we need to exchange speech, we need to exchange meaning in this dialogue model, right? Um, and that that is what's going to lead us to some kind of authentic reconciliation. Um, and this may be true for many people, but what I'm arguing against especially is an oversimplified notion of this as happening in any sort of linear way. Um, that we somehow are going to come to healing through this particular kind of speaking of experience, speaking of suffering, speaking of memory, speaking of the self. Um, and to caution that things might not be quite so linear as they, as they appear. Um, and again, this oftentimes borrows from models from other philosophical and historical traditions, things like um, biomedical models. You see this a lot if anybody's read much about the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You see it a lot in the language of that commission, especially in the language of um, Desmond Tutu, who talks a lot about the necessity to open wounds so that they can be cleansed, so that a society can heal that borrows these biomedical metaphors and also borrow from these religious metaphors, things like speak and ye shall be healed. Um, again, this notion that this somehow happens in a relatively linear and straightforward way. Um, and our practice models, of course, build upon these assumptions, assuming that dialogue is a form of exchange of speech, therefore an exchange of selfhood to the extent that speech is seen as the expression of authentic self, um, and that that's going to lead to this greater understanding between self and alienated other, and that that's going to lead, again, in a relatively linear and straightforward way towards something that we can call reconciliation. Um, so that's my, first uh, that's my first contention. And then framing it as a contention because I recognize that um, it's contentious, that it is troubling, I think, to some of our assumptions. So I'm, I'm quite happy to, to have this be critiqued in our discussion. And again, sorry for the, um, the keynote to PowerPoint mess up here. So my second contention, um, and this is linked, is that car theory and practice has been deeply ambivalent about silence. Um, so silence has been understood to mark a failure, a failure of reason, uh, a failure, obviously, of speech, a repression, a form of power that suppresses, that pushes down the natural tendency to speak the self, the natural tendency to communicate with others. Um, this is where reason fails. This is where meaning fails. So on the, it's a limit point, and on the other side of that limit point is violence, maybe madness, um, irrationality, that when dialogue fails, on the other side of that is silence as irrationality. Um, and that people in post-conflict or conflict settings may actively choose not to speak in the way in which we expect them to, um, <clears throat> or that they make they may make and share meanings that come in other kinds of forms, so indirect or nonverbal forms of sense creation, ritual, performance, bodily praxis, art, humor, other forms of speech that don't necessarily map onto the genres that we're used to um, has been an underexplored possibility both theoretically and also in our practice models. We're not really quite sure what to do with this thing, right? We have a sense, I think many of us, that silence can actually be meaningful, that there may be other forms of speech other than the kind of more didactic or mimetic forms 
that we're used to listening for, but we're not quite sure what to make of them and how we could possibly incorporate those into practice. So that would actually, I think, be an interesting conversation to have um, after I've finished just talking about these examples. So, and then finally, um, and this is a quote from a, a, an upcoming volume, there's been more attention to this notion of how do we theorize silence. Some people have been doing this from the discipline of music, which is really quite interesting, drawing on different philosophical traditions. Um, some people have been doing this from a religious perspective, from a religious studies perspective, and so on. But this is one book um, that's coming out that's talking about this from a feminist theory perspective. And the quote here is that the figure of the subaltern gaining voice captures the political imaginary. Um, and I think we can see this, right? The idea that, and you, th you think about 1970s fem feminist movements, other forms of liberation movements, the idea of marginalized people or subaltern peoples gaining voice is seen as being equivalent to their gaining agency, to their gaining some kind of power. So voice has been made equivalent with agency. The flip side of that is that silence has been made to seem equivalent with disempowerment. Um, the figure of the subaltern gaining voice captures our political imaginary, but they argue that this shifts the focus away from the labor that might be demanded of those in positions of power to learn to listen in other kinds of ways than which we are used to. So those are my two contentions. Um, I want to ask what happens when we widen the frame a little bit. You can see the little graphic there. Silence means security. Um, so we have some scholars here, of course, like Sarah Cobb and Solon Simmons, who have been opening this up a little bit for us um, by analyzing the narratives that frame and that drive conflict and helping us to understand when we're talking about narrative, when we're talking about discourse, we mean more than just talk in the narrow sort of way. Um, and there's a number of ways in which you could define this broadened, um, this broadened frame of what this might mean. And this is just one potential definition from Phillips and Hardy, who write about discourse analysis um, as an interrelated set of texts the practices also of their production, dissemination, distribution, and reception. So the whole set of social practices that go along um, with channeling and then also damning speech in particular kinds of ways. So what I want to ask what happens if we broaden our frame um, of what this might mean? What does this do to our understandings of silence? Um, and so if we broaden our frame, if we don't broaden our frame, we can't see these silences as anything other than a failure to communicate this limit point where reason, rationality, um, I'm, I'm thinking in Indonesian for some reason, what's the word? Um, sort of expires, sort of fin yeah, habis, um, finishes itself off. So, so, so far so good? Yeah, sure. So far so great. I so far so good, yeah. okay, all right, okay. Um, so, to make this clear, what I want to do is I want to ground this in, eth in ethnography because that's, as I said when I was introducing um, the research, that's how I make sense of the world and that's how I also I theorize. Rather than theorizing in the abstract, uh, my preference has always been to ground this in people's lives and words and concerns and silences. Um, so I want to turn, first of all, to post-genocidal Bali, Indonesia, where I've been doing work for um, probably about 15 years now. Um, so very briefly, I know a number of you have taken classes with me or heard me talk about this and so are familiar a little bit with this context. Um, but for those of you who aren't, between October and December 1965, approximately one million Indonesians were massacred. Um, about a million and a half were also jailed as political prisoners, most of them up until the late 1970s, as alleged communists or leftists. <coughs> this was at the height of the Cold War in Southeast Asia. So this activity, this genocidal activity was supported by Western countries, including the US, the UK, and Australia. Um, and it was very much a, a hidden genocide in the sense that it's not really on our master list of atrocities of the 20th century. So when I used to start talking about this, um, people wouldn't even necessarily know where Indonesia was. Now, now people know because Obama spent some time there and um, Eat, Pray, Love, the movie, people have, will have heard a bit about Bali. Um, but they don't associate it generally with mass violence. In Bali itself, which is a very tiny island about the size of Rhode Island, um, something somewhere between 8 and 12 percent of the population were killed in the space of three months. So actually in terms of the killing rate in Indonesia, it's really equivalent to the genocide in Rwanda, but it's been very much silenced because it was a good, it was a good genocide. Um, so right afterwards, the headline in the New York Times was a ray of light for Southeast Asia. Um, you know, communism has been vanquished. Um, free market democracy is, is now on the rise and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a politics to certain forms of silence, why it is that we don't know very much about what has happened um, in this particular part of the world. Um, 
But anyway, so after the genocide, immediately following, Suharto's military regime steps into power, stays in power for 32 years, and constructs a lavish, robust nationalist narrative um, accompanied by th things like the Museum of Communist Treachery in Jakarta, where Sarah Federman and Alison Castell went with me on a field trip, right, um, for our Indonesia summer course, which is still extant. Lots of dioramas of horrific things communists were supposed to have done all across the world, all throughout history, and so on and so forth. Um, <laughs> and that constructs the state, the New Order state, as the guardian of the nation and as the bulwark against barbarity and so on. So there's this very robust national narrative. Um, there's absolutely nothing in public culture that is allowed um, about civilian casualties. So this figure of a million people dead is nowhere to be found either in the mass media, in school textbooks, college textbooks. Um, it really is something that is silenced that is suppressed, and it still is today. So if you go to Indonesia today and you pick up a high school history textbook, you still will find nothing about the massacres. Um, so although things are now starting, um, what is it now? It's too hard to step down for power in 2008, so five, what is that? Yeah, five. Yeah, okay. 13 Yeah, sorry, 1998. 50, yeah, okay. 15 years ago. Thank you, yeah. I'm, I'm mathematically challenged. Um, so things have started to, to seep out into, into public culture, but there still is very little. So even 15 years post-dictatorship, there's nothing in the, in the school textbooks. Um, so there's this robust national narrative. Um, something that's also important in this context is that perpetrators and, and victims live side by side, oftentimes in very small, close-knit communities where the guy who was responsible for killing your parent might you might pass him walking to school in the morning, right? Um, so people literally living maybe 100 meters apart. And this was in some ways an artifact of the forms that the, that the violence took in that the military apparatus was very intent upon having lots of local participation so that blame could be dispersed, so that this could be seen as some kind of natural uprising of nationalist sentiment by the Indonesian people against communist others, um, and so there was a lot of effort to, to arm and to support local paramilitaries, so after the violence was over, these folks oftentimes stayed together in the same kinds of communities, and so this is very important. So one of my first research questions when I first started working there as an anthropologist was really to try to understand how did people live with that kind of intimacy, with that kind of social intimacy, if not emotional intimacy? How did, how did they live in such close proximity? 10, 15, 20, 25 years after the fact? What happened to their children? What happened to their grandchildren? How did violence seep into the textures of everyday life and social interaction? Um, and silence, you can imagine, is one of the ways in which people managed that kind of geographic proximity, political proximity, um, without having conflict re-erupt. So oftentimes people chose silence as a very active, intentional strategy to protect themselves and also, also to protect their children um, from harm. Um, should somebody know that somebody in their family had been killed as a communist and therefore they were politically tarnished, um, you would want to be silent with your children and your grandchildren, not tell them the story of what happened to your family because you would want to protect them. So there's a lot of silence um, that was part of managing that kind of proximity. Um, but when I first started there, I was really fascinated by the fact that the majority of scholars of Bali, of whom there are a lot, so if you're an anthropologist, it's kind of a classic place um, within the anthropological literature to work in, to theorize. So folks like Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson, who are quite well-known anthropologists, mentors, um, lots of people were fascinated by this very complex sort of Hindu animist culture and wrote about it kind of in those terms. So wrote about Balinese arts, Balinese music, Balinese culture, without acknowledging the fact that this massacre had done away with 8 to 12 percent of the population. And those who did write about it had a tendency to say, okay, well, Balinese no longer want to talk about this. Um, it's this traumatic thing. It's been put away in the past. They no longer think about it, they no longer talk about it, they no longer even maybe remember it. Um, and so I was really interested in this because when I started working there, people were talking about it with me, but they weren't necessarily talking about it in this, if you think back to my 
where people stand up and say, this is what happened to me. This is what happened to my father. This is what I saw. This is what I remember. People talked about it um, using what I thought of as kind of crosstalk or sideways talk. So for instance, it would be late at night and someone in the village will have di had died. You need to find a good day on the ritual calendar to do this. And this might be um, weeks out, actually, right? So you keep the body there on ice. And like in many parts of Southeast Asia, oftentimes people will stay up late. They'll be gambling. There'll be a funeral casino. Um, they'll be playing cards, playing dice. Lots and lots of drinking goes on. Um, and people start talking kind of on the edges of these kinds of events. And one of the things that they will talk about is the violence and the, the relationship of the violence to the deceased. So I started, when I started going to these late night events and sitting with people as they were gambling and drinking um, and sort of not going back to my hotel in the daytime and comfortably sleeping, when I started doing the work that anthropologists do, um, I started to hear this kind of crosstalk about, oh, that person who died, yeah, he had a stroke. And how pillars would be paralyzed, almost this metaphor that sort of looked at the karmic, um, the karmic retribution that would come to people who had killed, that they themselves would be sort of paralyzed and unable to act. So it was, it was a quite interesting way of speaking about it. Um, but I started hearing people telling these kinds of stories, but again, not in the kinds of genres that, we're, that we expect when we think about what speech about violence or what speech about conflict looks like, what it sounds like. Um, so I started becoming more interested in kind of poking at this idea that Balinese don't want to talk about it or they don't want to remember it. And I started thinking, hmm, maybe it's just not that we're, we're not listening in the right kind of way. Um, maybe we're not listening to the silences and what they actually mean. Um, because in Bali as well, there's a long tradition of using silence as a very active form of protest. So if I'm mad at Sarah, like, what I will do if I'm Balinese, I won't show up to her event. We kind of do that too. Maybe, yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's and, and it's Actually, a, it, it sort of happens around here. Yeah, and it's a very clear <laughs> statement of I, I am mad at Sarah. And all of you would know. Leslie's not here because she's because Sarah she thinks Sarah has done this thing. Um, so this idea of using silence as an active form of meaning making was very, very common. So I became interested in kind of poking at this notion of what does it mean that people that people aren't talking about this thing? Um, is it just that Western people have preferred to quote forget? that we participated in you know, arming and supporting the Indonesian military in its project to massacre a million leftists? Is there something also about our own silence um, that's quite particular and has more to do with, our, with, with us than anybody else? Or is it really that people have forgotten um, and they're not speaking? So I, I wanted to understand the contours and the textures of the silence and these crossways sort of forms of speech um, and how exactly, yeah. So rather than I remember or I suffered, these kind of more didactic, straightforward, mimetic forms of language, how they used other forms of language, other forms of, of silence, other forms of, of being and communicating. Um, so after the fall of Suharto in 2008, a lot of people came to Indonesia interested in bringing notions of transitional justice. Um, the International Center for Transitional Justice set up shop. There was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was authorized by Indonesia's parliament, although um, five years later it was deemed unconstitutional by Indonesia's Supreme Court, earning Indonesia the dubious distinction of being the first and only country to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission authorized and then canceled. Um, it's now sort of hanging nowhere um, with not much hope of being resuscitated. Um, but there's a lot of talk about transitional justice post-conflict contexts, and some of these assumptions that I started off with in these two contentions, you started to see sort of trickling in to Indonesia, especially among young human rights activists. Um, so you started to see people talking about the necessity of speaking about the past, the necessity of being able to get up and testify at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in order for the nation to heal from its wounds, in order for it to move past what had happened. Um, so a lot of these notions that I'm locating in a particular Western historical context also became quite prevalent in Indonesia. And so then my focus, of, part of my focus of my research turned to looking, at, to looking at what happens when these come into tension with local ways of framing something like recovery or framing something like memory or framing something like what it means to live 
past a dictatorship, what it means to live past mass violence. So I started looking at these tensions that emerged, these frictions that emerged, um, as these different ways of speaking, um, keeping silent, thinking about the past came into, came into to contact. Um, so young people started talking about this. Um, and they start to act as something of, of a set of conceptual gatekeepers, I would call them, um, who, who then worked at the local level to tell people how they should organize um, their memories, their speech, and so on and so forth. So that became a very interesting part of my project. Um, again, who is best known for her work writing about, analyzing, and serving as something of, of an advocate for Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, where she writes that a failure to remember collectively triumphs and accomplishments diminishes us, but failure to remember collectively injustice and cruelty is an ethical breach. It implies no responsibility and no commitment to prevent inhumanity in the future. Even worse, failures of collective memory stoke fires of resentment and revenge. Um, so this is a, a quite clear statement in favor of being able to collectively remember and articulate and to speak about, I would argue, also is implicit in this quote, um, the past in a particular kind of way. And that not doing so is not only problematic and that it would stoke the flames of conflict and lead to its recurrence, but that it constitutes a form of ethical breach, um, which is a pretty intense statement, right? So that to not collectively remember, to not construct a collective articulation of the past or a collective articulation of violence um, would constitute a form of ethical breach. Um, so these are the kinds of notions that start seeping into Indonesia and that young people started picking up and working with. Um, and so I want to talk just a little bit about what happened. Um, so this is a group of young people that I've worked really closely with. This is Bali. And in the foreground here, they have taken little rocks and made a kind of mosaic it says Taman 65, which means 1965 Park. Um, what this is is a square of grass and stone about, I don't know, how big would you say it is? Like, smaller than this room, like maybe half the size of this room. Yeah. yeah. Um, where children and grandchildren of people who are killed or people who are imprisoned during the violence have come together to exchange their experiences, to talk about their experiences, to understand something about this past era of violence that they had been brought up um, not knowing very much about because oftentimes their parents or grandparents had intentionally kept it from them to keep them safe. Um, so they came together, children of, of victims and then also children of perpetrators in the end, um, to try to share their experiences. Um, they borrowed a lot from these new models of transitional justice and this necess necessity to speak of the past or risk ethical, ethical breach. Um, and what they did was they went around and tried to first of all collect oral histories from their parents and their grandparents um, to demand that they tell what had happened to them, even though sometimes these older folks were quite reluctant to do so. Um, and it was very interesting. It caused a lot of tension because some of the older people, I don't want to share this. Some of them had very good reasons to not share it, especially when they lived side by side with people who had perpetrated violence, or especially oftentimes in cases of things like sexual violence, where women were reluctant not so much to have this um, known because it would somehow shame them, um, but they didn't want it to change their relationships with their children or with their spouses and so on and so forth. So they wanted to, to not necessarily talk about this. Um, but the young people then demanded this, oftentimes, these oral histories, as their right to know about the past and as their responsibility to, be to, to, to tell them um, or to constitute this kind of ethical breach, right? So you must tell this story because otherwise, if we keep silent about it, justice can never be done, we can never move on from the past. Um, and these stories belong to us as well, not just to you, because we are a collective, we need to reconstitute our community in this collective sense. Um, so there was a lot of tension around the demand for oral histories and then the reluctance on the part of many to, to actually tell them and to share them. And the real sense that these kids, um, they were maybe not kids, like late teens, like mid, up to mid-twenties, you can see in the foreground, that's a, a, a large bottle of um, Bintang beer. They didn't necessarily trust these young people, to take care of these stories, to do what, they, what should be done with them, to treat them cautiously. 
So there was a lot of concern that they would be disseminated and that they would be spread in ways that they would find troubling and that would maybe lead to other forms of conflict. Um, so the idea that a story or that speech is something that you have to be cautious about, that you can't just kind of throw it out, you can't just live tweet it um, for anybody to see, but that you have to be very cautious of the routes it takes and the ways in which it's distributed. So there's a lot of tension around not necessarily trusting this younger generation. Um, and this, again, also drew upon traditional Balinese notions of, um, in Bali, there's a, a, a concept called ajawera, which means do not disseminate. Um, the idea that there are certain texts that are so dangerous and sacred that if you speak these words, they can transform things in the invisible world that you shouldn't, not everybody should have access to them. Only people who are trained and who have had particular rituals done should be able to have access to these kinds of texts. So the idea of thinking about the distribution of speech, thinking about not just its production, um, but where it goes and what routes it travels um, was something that older people were very, very concerned about and weren't really sure that these young people um, who had potentially been drinking a lot could really actually do successfully. Um, and here, if you don't mind, this is just a, an extended quote from an article I have about this, which is entitled Building a Monument, which is about the process of building this 1965 park and some of the, the tensions that emerged um, that I'll just read to you and it'll give you more of a sense of what, of what kinds of the textures of the, the silences and the indirections of speech that I'm talking about. Um, so many young people grew extremely frustrated with those elders they saw as reluctant to tell them about what they had experienced in linear expository form, using a language of rights and responsibilities to attempt to elicit oral histories. These survivors were not, as their children often assumed, simply silent, muted by power and awaiting the release of their words. Older family members often doubted that their children and grandchildren could be trusted to read the lo local social landscape with canniness and care, avoiding speech that could spark tensions. Their stance was not simply one of fear provoking silence, but of practiced familiarity with less positivist articulations of the past. They had long used Balinese languages of karmic justice to whisper of the misfortunes of killers or the corruption of the judiciary, communicated with those who had been executed through ritual trance, or engaged in psychic divinations to discover who had reincarnated in their family's children. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. Um, women had whispered stories of their suffering while doing their day-long work of weaving ceremonial offerings, and men had commented obliquely on how perpetrating violence had called forth the fate of an early demise while gathering at the late night wakes of the village's deceased. Yet such work of remembering, so often inflected by the otherworldly, was often discounted by the young activists for whom such language seemed backwards and old fashioned, politically defeatist, or uncomfortably resonant with state attempts to control Balinese subjectivities by asserting an apolitical something traditionalism that could be used to maintain social order and to sell Bali to foreign tourists. Um, so again, sort of these tensions between different models for how one is supposed to engage and speak of or not speak of the past. Um, ritual became really important to this. Actually, I want to show you this one first. Um, so when I first started working in Bali, I was, I was quite resistant to working on ritual because there was this long tradition of anthropologists who were doing what I thought of as a culturalist, apolitical work. Um, where they would only look at ritual and isolation from politics, or they would only look at sort of music and the arts, and, and not, as I said earlier, attend to the fact that, that Bali was also um, dotted with mass graves. Um, so I was a political anthropologist, I was also 24, um, so I was a political anthropologist, so I wasn't going to work on ritual. But what I found, to my surprise and then later delight, because um, it became a really fascinating um, topic of conversation with people was that ritual became one of the primary ways in which people talked about, expressed, um, dealt with the violence. Um, so this is a, a picture of a, a woman and her child. So what happens in Bali, so the Balinese are, are Hindu, but Hinduism inflected with animism. So unlike in Indian Hinduism, where you reincarnate, but it's a bit abstract, right? So you could come back as a, as a dog, you could come back as um, an exalted human, so it's, it's not really clear, you don't really know, you're just hoping for the Only what you do is when a child is born, you take that baby to a psychic who goes into trance and tells you exactly who is reincarnated in that child. Um, so when my kids were born, a posse of, of it's usually older women who handle this um, process, so a posse of older 
to the psychic, who is also usually an older woman, and she goes into trance and she says something like, um, I'm trying to remember what, what it was with my kids, something about that relative from the past who had really long toes. And I had no idea what she was talking about. Like, puns usually, usually don't wear shoes. So, but so all the older women there, like, were me, like, yeah, 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 that one who had really long toes. Um, and then they sort of talk amongst themselves. They kind of caucus about, like, yes, 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 I think that that's right, or mm, no, 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 and they take themselves off to another psychic. Um, so it's a negotiation. So sometimes they'll go to like four or five psychics before they get the one, they, before they get the narrative of who this is that they really like, that they feel comfortable with. Um, and usually the, the parents of the, of the child themselves are kind of really marginalized in this process and are too young to really know much. Um, so it's fascinating as well in, in its gendered terms. But, um, but anyway, so this is one place where people have to negotiate as to whether a deceased relative has reincarnated or not. So somebody who was killed during the massacres, whose body may actually have been placed in the mass grave, unknown, um, uncremated, without the ritual offerings that would normally accompany a death, this becomes a site, again, of tension where people have to decide um, whether or not we're going to accept back these relatives who had died. Um, and there are all kinds of fascinating sort of anecdotal stories that I heard from people about what happened to these communists, these communists who then reincarnated in children. Um, I heard a lot of stories from young people themselves who were reincarnated communists and they would be blamed by their family members every time they did something sort of daring or bad, you know, oh, it must be because you're the reincarnation of a communist. Um, so it was a really interesting and very, very rich site of people remembering and speaking about the past but again, not speaking about it through this genre of, oh, I remember um, you know, the day they burned down my house, or oh, I remember what happened when my father was killed. It was a much more sort of active, sort of textured encounter with the almost literal material substance of the past um, as the reincarnated soul made flesh. Um, so ritual became a very interesting part of what I was trying to look at, um, and again, raised all these questions about speech. So, Think that there's one more about this. Um, and then this is another very interesting project. So this was actually a project that was done by a local Muslim NGO. It's, the, it's called Natlahu Ulama, and it's the largest Muslim organ, mass organization in Indonesia. It has about um, 25 million members currently. It's one of the largest mass Muslim organizations in the world. Um, but anyway, a lot of their members perpetrated violence during 1965, and that's kind of too long a story to go into how that happened to be. Um, but so it was a lot of children and grandchildren of perpetrators of violence who then decided that they needed to do something as an organization to address what their parents and grandparents had done. Um, and they tried to get together with those who were victims of violence, those who had been political prisoners, um, children of victims of violence, to try to affect some form of reconciliation. And so they started with these models that we're also familiar with at a place like Escar. So they started really relied on dialogue. So they brought people together. I can remember one event, it was a lot of psychology graduate students, as well as graduate students in the conflict studies department um, at a particular university in Java. And they brought these older people together to talk about what had happened to them, right? Um, so to share their experiences, to speak about the past, to speak about what they had suffered. Um, and the older folk were like, uh-uh, we're not having this, we're not ready to talk. Um, and so what they wanted to do was before they were going to talk about anything in this kind of I remember sort of way, they wanted to have a performance. They wanted to do a performance together, they wanted to act in a performance collectively of Javanese slapstick comedy. So sort of think like Three Stooges meets like Javanese dance, if that <laughs> means anything to you. Um, where people literally, literally sort of hit each other and they fall down. Um, and it was really appalling. You, know, you sort of imagine these young, eager master students in conflict analysis and resolution, they want to do like a Three Stooges performance where they're going to punch each other. Like, victims and perpetrators, and it sounded completely wrong. Um, but that's what they wanted to do. So they wanted to be able to, as they explained it to me, they wanted to be able to laugh. They wanted to be able to communicate and to exchange some form of meaning in another kind of way before they could even possibly imagine sitting down and doing something like speaking of what they had experienced, um, sharing their experiences, talking about the past in that, in that form of way. Um, and it was, it was just so fascinating because I, I can recall like one of the psychology students like actually like 
fainted. She was so upset. And like they were actually coming to comfort her and sort of pouring water. I mean, it was, it was a very, very interesting, sort of ex very explicit clash of different kinds of assumptions about what something like healing might mean. Um, so, okay, all right. So that is what I have to say for the moment about Bali and how I became interested in this theme of silence, um, which I said you know, filters through my work in various kinds of ways. So now I want to turn to another context um, and get ready for the my world premiere of my seven minute um, documentary film excerpt that I'm so excited to show you. Um, so this is post-peace Aceh. So Aceh is the province, the very northernmost province of Indonesia, the very top tip of, of Sumatra. It's quite a distance from Bali. Um, it's most well known for the damage it sustained during the 2004 tsunami. Um, so these kinds of images might be familiar to you. That's, I mean, just an extraordinary, ex extraordinary extent of, of destruction. Um, and so late De December 2004, the tsunami um, hits in early 2005, there's a peace agreement signed between the Free Aceh Movement, which had been fighting for a separate Aceh state for decades, arguably even since the Dutch colonial era, um, and the Indonesian government. And so my work in Aceh started after the peace agreement, trying to understand what happens after peace. So the formal peace agreement is signed. Um, you see this influx of international and national NGOs who are coming to implement transitional justice and conflict resolution measures. Um, after about a year or two, everybody packs up, they're done, they leave, and then the development people come in, um, right? So they do things like education, um, sort of social development, livelihood programs, and so on and so forth. The conflict resolution work is done, right? So I was really interested in, and I'm putting, I'm doing this thing with my hands because that means that I think that that's crazy, basically. Um, that conflicts obviously don't simply cease just because someone has signed a peace agreement, um, in this case in Helsinki, Finland, between a group of armed combatants and then the Indonesian state. There are all kinds of issues that weren't addressed in the peace agreement. And so I was really interested in how people work with the peace that they are in some sense given um, by elite actors. And so in order to do this, I really wanted to return to my anthropological roots. Um, I was feeling nostalgic for when I was you all's age. Um, and so I decided that I was going to do an ethnography of a road. So this was a 365 kilometer highway that was built as the centerpiece of US post-conflict reconstruction. Um, and it linked Banda Aceh, which is the capital of Aceh, to Chalang in the south, which is more towards what Achenese called the Republic of Indonesia, sort of indicating that they don't feel that they belong to it. Um, but they built this highway, and they built it to, to quote, California highway standards. It includes things that you see nowhere else in Indonesia, like guardrails and these familiar yellow signs and so on and so forth. Um, and so I went out there with my research team and a cinematographer who's a colleague at the University of Minnesota um, and an Indonesian performance studies um, scholar from Minnesota and also an Indonesian anthropologist. And we just kind of went out on the back of motorbikes over the course of a couple of summers and traveled the length and breadth of this road, stopping to talk to people literally on the side of the road to try to understand what they were saying about peace which was different than what those in the capital or those who were driving along the road. Um, Aceh is known for having one of Southeast Asia's only Hummer dealerships. So literally, oftentimes in Hummers, um, with the tinted windows rolled up, speeding along this road. So I was interested, we already knew what they thought. And the mass media, what people were saying <laughs> along this road. I told this anecdote before. The first summer that I spent there, um, after I had finished a couple of sort of dirty, sweaty months of back of, uh, weeks of back of motorbike ethnography, um, I was at the airport in Banda Aceh and I was at the one coffee shop at the airport, I think it was during Ramadan, so it was the one coffee shop at the airport that was open during Ramadan with a big curtain up front so that nobody could see you inside having coffee um, for all the humanitarian aid workers. And I ran into this guy who was a postdoctoral researcher, who had been a postdoctoral researcher here at SCAR. Um, it was really just kind of weird, right? <laughs> I was like, hey, how are you? He's like, hey, how are you? Um, I was like, yeah, 
I'm great. I just had this amazing time. I just spent three days here. And we talked to the mayor and we talked to the governor and we talked to the head of this and the head of that. And you know, everything is just going so well here. It's such a successful, it's just, it was just such a different perspective than I got like literally on the side of this road. Um, but anyway, that just kind of reassured me that I was on the right track of trying to understand something, um, what was happening on the, on the margins of, of more hegemonic discourse. So, but anyway, so in the aftermath of this peace agreement, I became interested in this as well because of the kind of, I think that, that Sarah might call it narrative compression, perhaps, um, but the kinds of discursive constraints that were happening precisely because of how the piece was being framed. So I heard a lot of people saying literally, don't disturb the piece. Um, the piece is this fragile, sort of I kind of imagine it as this like little China dog kind of thing. So it's this fragile kind of thing, you can't disturb it. Too much unruly speech, too much back talk, too many claims for justice. Things like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was authorized in the peace agreement but still has not been put into place, that kind of speech, too much talking, is going to disturb the peace. Um, and so people would literally reference this phrase, don't disturb the peace, when they were talking about how they weren't supposed to talk. So they would say, you know, yes, this happened. No, it still hasn't been addressed. I've never got my compensation. I never got my DDR money because they said I was just a cook. Um, all of these things that, that, that people felt quite unhappy with, um, but I'm not supposed to disturb the peace because the former Free Aceh movement combatants, who were by then in power as the Free as the Aceh as the Aceh party, um, said that too much of this would disturb the peace, conflict would reoccur, and it would also be bad for things like foreign investment. So the Aceh needed to have this sort of stable, calm, complacent, um, not very much talking going on kind of peace so that foreign investors would want to come to Aceh. Um, so I started to become interested in this as also a space where it might behoove us to think about narrative and the kind of work that happens um, when people are told to speak or to not speak in particular kinds of ways. Um, and again, here, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission still also hasn't been in to, to, to put in power. Um, oh, and I, I obviously was half asleep this morning when I didn't finish that sentence, but what I wanted to say is that Achenes have not been silent. Um, they're quite vocal about a lot of what happened to them during the conflict, but a lot of that speech literally happens on the side of the road. And it also, again, takes these forms that are not the kind of forms of witnessing or testimony that we have come to think of as how people speak after violence, but it's often taken forms that are quite unsettling, um, like humor. So I'm gonna show you this clip in a moment, and it starts with something that Indonesians think is kind of falling on the floor humor. Um, and it takes other kinds of sort of crosstalk kind of forms where you speak about things, but you speak about them in indirect sorts of ways. So you critique the Hummer, but you don't really critique the, um, the role that that particular combatant now in power has been playing. So what I want to do is I want to show you the film. It's about eight minutes long. Hmm. Can we go get, can we, should we go get Cassie? No, I can do it. If, as long as it starts. We might need to get her for this. I think you might have to double click, like, the way you would. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Oh my. We've got this volume. And that's what they call it. They call it the Jalan Hitam, Jalan Hitam, the Black Highway. Wait a second. I have to figure out how to turn up the sound. Oh, it's, there's something on the board itself. I think there's a little dial like there's on the left of that little platform. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, if I'm going to world premiere, I feel like it has to be like theater perfect. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go to the theater. 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 I'm going to go to the the
Mau sekolah nggak mampu Mau masuk ke gawai PNS aja nggak lewat Ini kena urusan ke Medan Medan tekan tuh tekan maju bulan cek Masuk dan masuk di dalam Medan Tengah di dalam Medan Begini macam ini Makanya Kalau perangkat saya muda kali Kalau muka orang asing Itu jalan yang lebih Ini itu udah di PNU lah Tak perlu bahas lagi kasi bantuan tempu benda benda. Esok hari tempu akan tak ada. Oh, dikasih. Kepak apa? Dikasih jalan. Jalan yang mulus. Wah, DP DP kita pun tahu tu yang murah. Terus, kasi bantuan tapi benda benda. Kalau esok hari tu benda. Sudah itu. Orang aja yang bunuh dirinya sendiri. Tak perlu nak perlu perang. Nak apa? Nak 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 apa? Mami. Kau dah bunuh dirinya sendiri. Tiga kali dua puluh empat jam tak pulang-pulang, tapi kita juga menjaga kita. 
komplit pokoknya pada kalau nggak salah saya pada saat uh, ulang tahun nggak bukan cukup akan di, dijaga supaya operasi kita jangan berhenti saya ingat saya mungkin saya sendiri lima main ada saya lihat itu pak pagi pagi masuk pagi kan nggak di pinggir jalan kadang-kadang nampak kaki gitu saya kayak gitu kan bicaranya dekat ini. Tapi saya nggak takut lagi kenapa di sekitar ini kita cukup apa rapat sekali pos-pos militer itu pak. Di sini ada brimo, di situ ada opasusnya, di sebelah sana ada angkatan darat lagi dia gitu. Jadi kok sekitar sini mungkin di Jakarta ketat ya. Mungkin ada ya. Kemudian di semena ini kan di kita sini ada polsetnya, ada koramilnya, ada asma apa jipurnya, ada asrama. 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 Para-para itu nggak habis semua. Habis. Habis semua. Banyak aparat juga. Kenapa? Ada yang mau hilang Banyak. Makanya senjata banyak di situ dan pak tsunami. Itu kan di situ ada asrama jipur satu. Kena juga. Habis asrama jipur satu asrama. Orang Iya banyak kali tentara. Makanya orang-orang luar. when I have the whole um, hour and a half version in the spring, hopefully. Great. Very cool. oh, wonderful. So um, this was, you know, dense, beautiful, and so interesting. And do you want to just facilitate this yourself and just take questions? Sure. And you can help me. You people? can help me, Sarah. No, I'll just, you know, whisper to you if I see folks getting frustrated or left out. A lot of what I'm doing is pointing out tensions and pointing out um, Troubles, things that sort of trouble our, our, our sense of what should be and our sense of, of how to analyze and how to practice. So I'm not really here articulating um, a well-formed answer to what we should do with silences. I think that the extent of, of the claim that I'm making here today is that we need to think about them more and we need to think about other forms of speech and things that don't take the form um, of this kind of didactic I remember when. Uh, kind of speech that could be simply exchanged, and I'm using exchange um, very intentionally, the idea that this is something that, co that comes in a packet, and I can give you my experience and you can give me yours, and this is what constitutes our authentic relationship. So I don't actually know um, how we incorporate this quite well into, in, into, into, our, into our practice models, but I think it's something that we need to think about, and I think it's something that a number of us are starting to think about. Well, um, let's open it up. Do you have any comments or ideas or thoughts to share?